Ken here with the Manceptional Podcast. Welcome. If, um, if you're in your car right now, please don't do this. But if you're at home, take a look around on your walls or if you're in your office, take a look around and what do you see? You probably see some artwork. Well, you know, where does all this stuff come from? I'm not talking about cat photos, but actual paintings. Um, so today we have a creator of some of that artwork. Um, we have Eric Zener. He's been a fine artist for 25 years, exhibited globally. His uh, primary galleries are in New York and San Francisco. And uh, it's great to, uh, to have him on to discuss what his journey was. Being a fine artist is not exactly uh, the quote unquote safest path you can take when you come out of college. So uh, we kind of want to dig under the, under the paint, so to speak, and see how he came about doing this and, and uh, get some tips and insights on this kind of crazy world. So um, Eric, welcome to the podcast. Did I, uh, what did I miss on your, on your bio there? It was kind of general. Well, I think that's a pretty fair introduction about just, you know, kind of what I do for a living and perhaps just kind of how it started. Okay. I can touch on all that if you'd like. Yeah. I mean, uh, and one thing while I remember I want to talk about is, is uh, you know, the big question is how do, you, how do you make a living? How do you make a good living selling stuff that nobody needs? <laughs> well, <laughs> Which, <laughs> I'm, still, uh, I'm still trying to figure that out. No, it's, uh, that's a, it's a very kind of esoteric question and certainly an esoteric position to be in. Um, you're right. I mean, I make things that people want, but they don't need at all. Right. And when times are good, uh, want sequesters need, but when times are tough for people, then, you know, need sequesters want, right? I mean, it's the kind right. of not the most important thing on your, your list of consumption. Um, it's, it's, it really is a luxury. Now, you know, that's also kind of a broad stroke, no pun intended, because, you know, you can buy artwork that's very inexpensive and, and you can decorate your home and it can look nice. Um, I mean, like the stuff you get at the mall, those prints? Yeah, or, I mean, just, you know, there's lots of affordable ways to make your living experience aesthetically pleasing and match your tastes. I think when you get into a category of, you know, a quote unquote professional artist, you're dealing with a much smaller market of people that that they feel a greater sense of value in the painting, um, not just monetarily, but you know from maybe a, a greater way of of collecting uh, a certain genre of art or a certain period of art. There's all sorts of kind of micro markets inside of an already small market, right? And I think for artists to to make a living and to find that sort of gold vein so that they can sustain themselves for decades is authoring something that's truly theirs. You know, they're not ripping people off mm -hmm. and somehow through some magic pixie dust, that's hard to really, really define find imagery and a continuous story of their work that really touches and reaches people. Um, reaches something in them that's universal. Uh, right. if, it's if you're just making pretty things, there's nothing wrong with that at all. You're, 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 it's more like being a, a, you know, a pop singer. You, know, you might not have the staying power. You might just, it might be like fashion that's just cool for a little while but doesn't last. Right, right. So, you know, so now we're getting into the, the art world and I've got a lot of questions there, but let's back up. Um, you know, our audience is, is interested in, in the journey and how you may have been down one path and then now you ended up on this path or, or maybe, you know, your entire life you uh, knew you were going to do this, which would make you very lucky. Um, but just kind of backing up from the beginning, we don't have to start from the yeah. womb, but, uh, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I know you grew up in San Diego and were a surfer kid with long hair. Um, maybe, you know, at that point, did you have any inklings about 
either being an artist or what you were going to do at all? Or, you know, how did you jump? No. How did you get into this is what no, I'm asking. I, I'm fully humble enough to recognize that, you know, a large part of it was just by accident, quite frankly, and, and some of life's circumstances that just created the opportunity to, to look at making art and then eventually see that it could be a vocation. I mean, a really quick and dirty um, background on me is, yeah, you're, I grew up in San Diego and, you know, and that lifestyle in, in the 70s was very uh, creative, sort of post-hippie era, uh, surf community, a lot of uh, non-professionals, uh, if you will, meaning like doctors, lawyers, bankers, there were a lot of therapists, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs. Um, it, it wasn't a uh, nose to the grindstone type of professional community. Mm -hmm. this, was in this was Encinitas, right? Yes. So that's, you know, that there's a little bit of just luck there. If you want to, want to use the word luck, I just happened to have grown up in an environment that was, um, fertile for artistic ventures. Uh, my grandmother, um, she had a, a, an influence on me. She was a very prolific painter, mainly a hobbyist, but mm. it was her personality and what she did. And I have memories as a kid of, going to her house and she was very eccentric and seeing all of her paintings and her big Picasso books and canvases. And I painted with her. I have paintings that she did of her and I painting when I was oh, okay. five years old. So well, there's some seeds there a little bit. Yeah. I mean, but you know, as a kid, I wasn't looking at this as this is what I'm going to do for a living. I was, you know, riding my bicycle and surfing and just being a kid, but it was a, it wasn't a foreign place for me and it was also creativity was really um supported in my own family my, my mother was uh very creative in her own way she played violin at the san francisco uh symphony my dad was a therapist and so i just grew up in a climate that was um interested and supportive of non-conventional ways of not only making a living, but just, you know, your life, your hobbies, mm -hmm. all that kind of just sort of floated around as a kid. Uh, you know, I would come in and out of my interest in art making, but I think a, a piece of DNA that stuck with me is that I was always really comfortable being alone. I mm -hmm. was a kid that could spend hours in my room playing the guitar or building models, or I liked making things. I didn't mm -hmm external stimulus, which I think is important for anybody in the art world. Uh, you have to be okay being alone for a long time and figuring things out by yourself. It's not a collaborative. I mean, so would you say, does that make you a, a loner, like no, an introvert? Because I, I don't see you as an introvert. No, I think it, there's a, there's sort of a, it's, you know, I can't find the exact metaphor, you know, two sides of the same coin or some duality to the personality, but I'm a, I'm professionally introverted for sure, but I'm extroverted when I'm not working. So okay. it's that extreme. So, but anyhow, so that kind of was sort of my childhood. Then I, then I went to college and that really screwed me up <laughs> because you know, I, I didn't pursue anything creatively. I was a, just a typical sort of lost liberal arts kid going to school because that's what you're supposed to do um you were in a band though yeah i was in a band which was fun. <laughs> um but you know early on i remember having you know a little bit of anxiety that i felt very directionless even in, in school um i was a decent student but there was no purpose to what i was there was no reason to be there for me you know and as it got closer and closer to graduating you know lots of kids kind of knew what they wanted to be and i had no clue at all zero me neither man i didn't i didn't have any clue i didn't know and i also was sort of you know the downside of the way i was raised i was kind of ill prepared for the reality of being a man and graduating from college and going out and you know getting started in the world i mean i didn't even know what the stock market really even was i didn't know anything 
<laughs> like grew up in the kind of a just mellow seventies, whatever kind of household. So I got out of school and moved to LA because I got a job from an on-campus interview at the university for a large department store chain, completely uninspired. That sounds very interesting. <laughs> what exactly did you do? What were you doing? We just, you know, just followed the, 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 the chain of lost kids getting farmed through on-campus interviews with, you know, giant companies like Procter and Gamble and all that. What, what was your exact job? Like, what were you, you know, actually I got doing? a job at the May, May Company Department Store, corporate, off, corporate offices, <laughs> Los Angeles, California, uh, through a management, you know, generic management trainee program, making zero dollars a year uh, in their buying department, which I'm not even going to, bore your listeners with the details, but essentially <laughs> sitting, sitting in a cubicle all day long with no windows because it was a department store upstairs, uh, just grinding out SKU numbers for stores around the state and deciding how many things to buy for the department that I was working in. It was miserable. I mean, I... I well, how, so how long did it take you to... Well, yeah. You go to the training, you're probably excited, there's other college kids, and then you, you actually know, go sit down in your cubicle... <laughs> To be honest, the sad part is, is I was never excited. I, I felt something felt wrong the day I accepted the job. <laughs> um, it, it, I, I, I definitely was a fish out of water, but, you know, scared 22-year-old rent in Los Angeles, you know, you just start going to work. Um, but the flip side to that and is that it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because... Had I found something that was somewhat inspirational or was there was a career path that had a financial. Yeah. Getting sucked I, hooked I, on the crack. They I, call I, it getting hooked on the crack of money. Yeah. I may not have ended up doing what I'm doing and what the big kind of aha moment was I was there for maybe a year I was I definitely would have been fired I mean I was a total <laughs> clock, I was a clock watcher you know at five at 459 <laughs> back in my bag and I'll never forget this scene it's like a scene in a movie that I, I can't I can't erase um it was a some random morning about a year in and I parked in the parking lot of the department store and there was a sea of men and women walking towards this bleak building on a smog <laughs> day in Los Angeles. Oh, my God. They were wetted by the sunrise. You saw their black suits and black briefcases walking like robots, like out of the 1984 commercial for Apple. That's what oh, my God. And I felt this huge sense of dread. And I, I can was, feel it now. And I just knew, I, I'm like, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew there was no damn way that I was going to survive in, in this, this track that I somehow stepped onto. And I was living with my roommate in, in, at the time. And he also was, uh, you know, questioning his, his choices professionally. And he started pouring all of his energy into creative outlets, mainly music. And I sat there one day and I was like, what? I, I need to get happy. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do for a living, but I need, to, I need to be happy as a person. And something just clicked in my mind that I remembered that I really enjoyed making things. I liked making art. It felt good. So art making started really just as, as a cathartic reaction to the disappointment of my life. It, was, it really was. Oh, man. It was therapy. You know, it made me happy. And I also got sort of the kind of male ego rush of validation from friends, from mm. family. I was doing something and getting a, I was doing it for me. But when you add to that, that you're getting positive feedback, that you have some value, even if it's, you know, silly at that point. That also helped say, gosh, you know, this is something I'm kind of good at and I like doing it. So I started doing it more and more and more. 
selling paintings for you know nothing you know having little shows and so wait how how did how did you go from i'm gonna paint in it oh this kind of feels good like you go to the store and buy a canvas i'm assuming and like oh this is cool and then how'd you get from there to start selling stuff i mean you know there really is in your apartment not like it's not like a normal job where then you go start interviewing you know it, it it it's organic and and that's a whole other conversation that we could talk about i it's it's a cousin to what I'm talking about, about the ephemeral uh, pixie dust that falls on some people and doesn't fall on others. But, but really it just sort of self evolved, you know, Mm -hmm. somebody down the hall in your apartment buys a painting and then their friend likes it. So you let them borrow one. And then their friend says, Hey, I have a friend that has a yogurt shop and you can hang them in there. It just, it's a snowball effect that, I was lucky enough that there wasn't a lot of resistance to the snowball growing. I didn't make, I didn't have any negative consequences. Uh, it just kept getting a little bit better and better. And at some point, I can't remember exactly, you know, maybe a year later or something like that. I was earning more income from randomly selling paintings than I was at the miserable prison cell that I worked at. And I think I was probably around, I can't remember, 23, I'm 52 now. I said, you know what? F it. <laughs> if there's that ever, it. Yeah. If there's ever, I, I mean, I knew I was, I was on, you know, professional suicide path. I said, I've got nothing to lose. And that's another benefit of making these choices when you're young. I had nothing to lose. So why not try it? And my personality, for better or for worse, is I'm I'm very very stubborn uh, when I make a decision. I'm mm-hmm. very black and white about it. If I'm going to do it, I, I'm I'm doing it. So did you think right at that point, I'm an artist. I'm going to make my yes. living. I mean, you already did right then and there. Yeah, I, I, this is what this is. It's not even this is what I'm going to do for a living. I decided that this is what I am. And there's a distinction. Right. That's a huge difference. A big, but it's a benefit of doing a non-conventional career is it, it embodies who you are, mm-hmm. what you are rather than, and there's certainly nothing wrong with this, somebody pursuing a career because they enjoy it and there's a financial incentive, but who they are is a rock climber on the weekends or they play in a band on the weekend. Right. Like you, it's basically people, uh, so you know, so happy it's Friday, yeah, type there's, thing. There's, Thank God it's Friday, TGIF, and they're off for the weekend. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that, and that's what I was saying earlier. Had I found a job at a school that I enjoyed, I would have that would have been my life. If right, I never painted, or who knows? But anyhow, so I I quit my job and hated living in Los Angeles. No offense to anybody who lives in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, I probably was just projecting my own, my own depression on the city, but mm-hmm. I decided I'm going to go travel around the world with a backpack for a year and absorb galleries, cultures, museums, people, and just sort of, you know, step into this new abyss with a lot of content. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, cause I didn't have a lot of life content. You know, I grew up surfing, went to Santa Barbara, went to college and then, you know, went to LA. So I needed, I needed content to come in. And on that trip that absolutely sealed the deal. I was incredibly blown away by just everything I saw and touched and experienced painted like crazy on the trip, uh, traded paintings for cheap pensions. Oh, uh, cool. And I was happy. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, wow. that's what we want to be. It's like, <laughs> oh. I mean, obviously, you can't backpack the rest of your life. I mean, maybe you can, but so the trip ended. I went to 25 countries over the course of a year. And during that period, my parents had moved to Australia. Mm-hmm. And I was broke at the end of the trip. And I said, well, I, I guess I should go there and, you know, kind of figure out how I'm going to do this. And uh, I painted like crazy there. And my mother used to drive me around Sydney to, to go see all the galleries. And I started pitching my work to them. 
And I got into my first quote unquote real gallery in Sydney in 1990 and was successful. I was right, so at, at this, at this level, um, how, you know, how advanced were, were you in your painting skill Horrible. compared because now <laughs> you look at your paintings now, oh, uh, we'll give yeah. the link later at the end of the podcast, but you know, you paint like practically photorealistic yeah. stuff, right? So at this point, you know, your skill factor, how much did you actually know, you know, like someone who went and got a fine arts degree in yeah. painting or whatever, like how are you compared to those people? I was horrible, but I was stubborn. <laughs> and my, uh, for lack of sounding narcissistic, it's also there was my personality strength or flaw is that I'm persistent. Mm -hmm. So whether the, because art is subjective, I mean, really who's to say if something's good or bad, I mean, you have your personal preference, you know, we've all had that experience of walking into a museum and seeing a giant canvas with the blue stripe and scratching our heads while it's there. Right. Yeah. Or like there's a toilet in the corner yeah. and I'm just well, kind of, yeah. Okay. But because I, I wasn't trained, and I just jumped into this choice with not a lot of, not, not a lot of years as an adult, even doing it as a hobby. I basically learned how to paint in the public eye. I, 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 I learned my craft while promoting it and selling it, which is, right. which is, doesn't really make a lot of sense on paper, but on the other hand, I had an active live focus group 24 hours a day. I would right. meet and I was able to get reaction on on where they fit or didn't fit in in the art world. Um, so it's a, tell me if this makes any sense. So to me hearing this and I, I just love hearing real stories of people or who are really doing it. Um, you know, it's kind of like just Get follow, follow your passion because if you have a passion, you'll you'll get through those bumps, right? But it's also just get started. Like you didn't think I'm going to learn how to paint first, and then I'm going to try to do it. You're just like I love this. I'm getting some good feedback, so I'm just going to go do it. You just started painting, even though you didn't really yeah. know all the all the tricks or skills that a quote unquote professional painter would know, and you're just screw it. You're, and you just did it. If you're waiting for the right moment in life, you're going to wait your entire life. Yeah. Um, now I, I, I wasn't, uh, trying to create things solely based on what I thought other people would want. You know, that's a, there's, that's a difficult line Oh, I've tried that before. It's so hard to guess what people want. Well, you, can't win, you, you don't, you don't win personally at all because you, you don't want to be serving your, your master as a, as a creator, because then you're not really being honest with yourself and you're not really being the author of your work. You're, you're, you're just trying to guess what people might like. That being said, there is an element of reality a few, you know, pure 100% absolute unabashed bravado creative freedom usually only comes with financial freedom. <laughs> so there has to be some level of, you know, I'm going to try a bunch of stuff that I like and I'm probably going to pursue the thing, the, the thing that I made that I like that other people like. Uh, yeah. It's a balance. And so that, that's kind of what my first sort of maybe 10 years out the gate or not, maybe not that long, but certainly, you know, years and years and years of not only harnessing my craft, but figuring out where I fit in this art world. And then, you know, it's just a slow, steady evolution that you, you know, you get, you get better, you, know, you get better at the whole thing, not just mm -hmm. at, the craft but you 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 get better at managing your way through the the twists and turns of a, of a very very strange industry <laughs> so what what would you know here's another question i always wonder this um whether it's with music you know you look on youtube and you see someone playing guitar and they're just like holy shit 
mm-hmm. just amazing, but they're wow. a nobody. Wow. Or you see these photorealistic paintings and you're like, holy crap, you know, but they're nobody. So how, you know, what, what sets, what set you apart? Let's just use you as an example, since you went through it, what sets you apart, you know, um, skill wise or, is it stubbornness or uh, marketing skills or, you know, some magic pixie dust uh, mix that you mentioned? What sets you apart that's made you uh, continue to grow and make a good living at this over a long period of time versus someone else who might be an incredible artist, uh, just, you know, technical artist, let's say. The short answer to what you just <laughs> asked is yes to everything. Yes. Okay. You know, it's oftentimes people will sort of say, ask the similar question and I'll say, I'm lucky. And somehow there's something wrong with that word. So they'll say, no, 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 it's not luck. There's no such thing as luck. You know, it's talent. It's, it's hard work. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Well, you put in the time and. Yeah, but I, yeah. I, I really, and it's out of time and being humble about the subjectivity of art that I know that there is an element of, for lack of a better word, luck. And what I mean by that is you have to have everything you just mentioned. You can be the greatest painter, whatever that means, just sort of by pop popularity or, you know, whatever. You could be a great technical painter or musician But if the other things don't come along with it that are important, like number one, support. Did you, do you have, do you have the emotional uh, support from your spouse, from your friend, Mm -hmm. from your parents? Did people tell you, you can't do this. You're not going to make it. You're crazy. Did you have people tell you that? So did, well, did, did you have any of that? Like, you know, when are you going to get a little job and never did, uh, but a lot of people do. And that, that could, that's a preventer. I mean, we're social creatures. If your girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse, mother, whatever, friends instill doubt in you, mm-hmm. it's going to lower your confidence and lower your, 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 the wind in your sails. So you need support, right? You need to, that's very, very important. Other things that you cannot control and you can call it luck are just your personality. You know, are you overtly shy? Do you have fear of failure? Do you, are you likable? I mean, these are things that you just, you either have or you don't. Right. And if you fake it, you don't, you're not going to make it. The fake it till you make it thing doesn't work in, with what I do. Um, there's also just timing. And these are all, these are, these are things that are, ephemeral right timing you know when did this happen in your life did it happen when you were strapped with four kids in college and underwater with mortgages are you going to quit your job and start a band it's harder you can gee i don't know that feeling (laughs) (laughs) that's half your audience and and that's just that's the reality of life you're not a loser nothing went wrong it's just you know that's part of life so timing it happened to me when i was making $20,000 a year working in a prison cell at 22 years old. I had nothing to lose. Right. There wasn't much risk at that point. It's sort of an amalgamation of all of these, these, these things that, or maybe you're born into a family. Maybe you're, you know, if you're Mick Jagger's son, you probably could start a band. Right. Or if you're, fathers your parents are worth a billion dollars you probably could go start a dream company that you've always wanted so there's there are things that are out of your control and there are things that are in your control and that's what i would define as yeah i'm kind of lucky <laughs> mm-hmm. do you do you get any um comments now about because you know where you live in san francisco it's obviously very uh, there's a lot of financial people, a lot of tech people, a lot of people with a lot of money, uh, a lot of people probably working 60, 80 hours a week. You know, do you get any snide comments m- like, oh, it must be nice to just work when you feel like it, or it must be nice to just roll out of bed or, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Like any, any people, they're, they're not purposely overtly trying to cut you down, but. Just, just my friends do. 
<laughs> no, I think that, I mean, I mean, I don't know. You usually you don't know half the things that people say or think about you in life. Mm-hmm. No, I, not too much. I think there's a, a more of a curiosity that people have when they know somebody that is doing something that's non-conventional. Mm-hmm. So it's more of a, it's not a jealousy thing by any means, but more of a head scratcher curiosity, you know, like, wait, how do you do this? So right. you, don't, you don't make any money all year and then you make it all in two weeks. How do you do that? You know, <laughs> but this is more of like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to them. And then, but conversely, I remember just last week, I have a good friend of mine that works at Salesforce and he invited me to come down and see their, this, the new tower in San Francisco. And I don't think I've stepped foot in an office building with people working. You know, obviously I've been in an office, you know, go to the bank or whatever, but I have not been in a place of work that where there's a culture of thousands of people working in decades. I don't, I don't remember quite frankly. And I was just as excited and curious and I was like, wow, you guys get free coffee on this floor. And look at those cool desks. And all these <laughs> yeah. people are going up and down elevators and they're in rooms collaborating and there's whiteboards. And there was a part of me that was sort of, you know, whatever word we're using here, curious, jealous, because I thought, God, how dynamic, how fun. Everybody just looks so smart and they're all solving problems together. You know, so I have this perception <laughs> of what that is like. How social. Wow, now look at everybody going out to lunch. You know, so you know, it's, it's funny. S- Salesforce is a former customer of mine. I've been in, you know, high tech sales for a long time. So back in the dot com uh, era, I sold them their first big, huge machine. <laughs> and uh, it's just, that's so funny. Yeah. yeah. So I think we're just, it's just, I think humans are just naturally curious when they see uh an you know a, a way of life that's really different than the way of life that, that they're leading yeah um i mean a lot of people they come to the studio it just cracks me up they'll they'll walk in and the first thing they do is go stand and look at my dirty palette and the brushes and all the paint tubes and i'm like why is that interesting but it's interesting to them because it's right. like what is this stuff? To me, it's just like, oh God, it's just a bunch of junk over there in the corner. <laughs> you, you know what I'm interested in just on the, on the art um, uh, world itself is how do they, um, I don't know if you can answer this. How, how do these things get priced? Like I keep seeing, you know, Christie's, um, you know, $60 million for some lost painting. I kind of understand that because it's a little bit historical and, uh, economically speaking what the market will bear you know but i mean how let's say something you do a painting how do you decide it's thirty thousand dollars or seventy five thousand dollars is it the size is it how much time you put in or is it just your prices go up over time and people pay so that sets the price and you just kind of up it a little bit or it seems kind of random to me without being in the industry Mm -hmm. yeah it is it is that's a hard question to really answer perfectly. And, and I get asked that a lot. It is because art is subjective by nature. It's almost impossible to put a kind of un- universal formula around art that follows a pricing structure. Mm-hmm. Now, that being said, you know, there has to be some logic to it. Otherwise, the, you know, uh, people, would, people wouldn't buy anything. An artist right. wouldn't know what to sell their work. So without being too long-winded, it, it really depends on a couple things. Number one, if you're talking about blue chip artists like, that are being sold at, at, at auction, uh, quote-unquote famous artists that are being sold on the secondary market, that those prices are set by their provenance because those paintings are not generally not being bought for people to live with the rest of their what life. What does provenance mean? You know, wh- the history of the artist, the history oh, okay. of the painting. You know, it, it sold at Christie's two years ago for $5 million. It sold last year at, you know, somewhere else for $8 million. 
And so this year we're going to try to fetch 10 million. You know, there's, it's, it's really more of a commodity that's being traded, not unlike a stock. You know, there's a valuation that a bunch of experts, quote unquote ex- experts, put on it based on a whole bunch of stuff, right? Well, what would you have to do to get to that level? Let's say, die. Do, you, do you have any, you have to die? <laughs> I mean, do you have any, do you have any goals? And like, have you thought about how could yeah, I, I sell you know, a painting I'm, for $5 million? I'm, I, I mean, it's, I would not, I would be very hesitant to call that a goal. I've done this too long and my I'm getting too old to be that much of a dreamer. It's more of a dream than a goal. I it's very hard, very, very, very hard for that to happen to a like Picasso artist. Picasso did it, right? He was a um, living artist. He made money while he was alive. I'm just it, you're, that's correct, but it's very hard. It's just like anybody at the top of their game in a creative industry to be the number one, you know, actor in the world and get an Academy Award. Think about how many millions of actors there are. I mean, it's just a statistical anomaly to get to that point. It doesn't mean it can't happen, but it generally happens when an artist was very, very successful and famous and and then they die because Mm -hmm. the prices go up because obviously... There's no more artwork to buy. Uh, Or an artist is incredibly just incredibly successful while they're alive. Most likely they're very old, you know, an artist like Gerhard Richter or David Hockney. These are, these are artists that, that at retail and galleries, their paintings fetch millions and millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. So I think it would be disappointing for that to be a high expectation goal for a living artist. So then what's the next, so then what's the more realistic dream and goal? That's more the path that that I'm in, and that is to to fetch you know very nice amount of money as a living painter in reputable galleries. Mm-hmm. That's and to, and to pers- keep pursuing that and to keep that going, and then in one layer below, there was many layers below, but another big layer below would be people that are more interested in volume. Like they're, they're commercial artists, you know, they are trying to get their work in every hotel. And you mean like posters and stuff? Yeah, you posters, graphic artists, you know, there are other ways to be successful besides, you know, making 20 paintings a year and having solo shows. But I, th- I don't know if I've answered your question that well about how it's done. It's, it's done somewhat randomly at the beginning most artists at the very, very beginning of their career kind of look around and see what most other artists at the very beginning of their career are selling their work for. And you just sort of start. You're like, well, thousand bucks, 800 bucks. It's, you're just kind of belong to a, 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 a pricing culture that's sort of sitting down around what people assume and expect to pay for purely decorative decorative art from artists that have no history, no bio, no history of shows. So you start there. Mm -hmm. Then as the years roll by, if you are selling your work, it's completely justifiable and expected by the people that bought your work that you start to increase. All right. They'd they'd actually be happy to see the prices go up because that means they bought something that other people see value in. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I'm very honest with people. They'll say, was my painting going to go up in value? And I'm like, I, you know, I think so, but don't buy this because you're hoping you're going to sell it in 10 years and make some money. I mean, it's just, that shouldn't, that, that's not, if, you, if you're going to play that game, then go get a lot of money and go to the auction houses. Right. So, so once that starts flowing and everybody, everybody sort of, yeah, okay, I've been painting for 10 years. I've had a bunch of sell, solo shows. You know, I, you start looking at other artists that are in galleries that are similar to yours. You start with other artists that paint similarly. Uh, and you find that we're all kind of around the same pricing, more or less. Okay, now I'm in the, now I'm in the $10,000 range, so something like that, right? Mm-hmm. At that point, it is somewhat formulaic by size because it's the only thing people can wrap their heads around. But you, you would, you would think so, even though, so I understand that, Oh, it's bigger. So it's cost more, 
But just because something's bigger doesn't necessarily mean it's a better painting. It, you're like, absolutely right. That's, but, it, but it's the only thing that sort of somewhat, <laughs> somewhat logical to wrap your head yeah, around. Even though it's not level. logical. Because you can't price on subjectivity. That's even, it's all ridiculous. Okay, let's just start <laughs> there. But it's even more ridiculous for it to be subjective. Because if you walk into a gallery and there's a painting of a, an apple that's, 12 inches by 20 inches and then there's a painting that's 12 inches by 20 inches of a bicycle and the gallery has them priced at two different prices and you ask why and they say well because this one's better what is how where's where's the how do you measure better it's it's it's, it's impossible so it's based on where the artist is in their career you know do they have a record of of you know a good good exhibition history good collections that they're a part of et cetera, et cetera. you know press magazines whatever you know do they have a do they have some meat on the bone and then it's by size for the mm-hmm. most part it's by the most part sometimes that'll be a little slippery if if a painting is just absolutely within this artist's work if a painting is very, very, very significant, significantly um, uh, more involved to maybe like if I did a painting that had 25 people in it photorealistically and it was a subject matter that everybody is trying is calling the gallery and wanting to get a hold of, you know, right. it, 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 things can be manipulated a little bit there. But as soon as you start going down that path, it's it brings you back to, well, this painting's better or this painting, he worked longer on this. And that's just, it's not a place that makes sense to a lot of people. And then once you start selling with multiple galleries, you need to have your, your pricing very, very similar because then galleries can be undercutting one another and it's confusing to- Which undercuts the, you also. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's gotta be an even playing field for everybody or you're gonna have, uh, collectors just shopping around for who's got the best price, and that, it's that's just not it just doesn't work. It's tempting, mm-hmm. but it doesn't work. Let me ask you this: so that uh, kind of another side of the art world is there? Has there? Do you have any stories or any times where um, you know being this artist, especially I guess if you're having your show, you're kind of like uh, living a little bit of a rock star lifestyle. You know, maybe <laughs> you know, do you ever get into like, does anyone ever notice you? Hey, you're Eric Zener. Um, you know, it's or, or like, gr- what about group groupies, like girl groupies at, a, at an yeah. opening or something like I that? Mean, you, get, you get a little bit of that, but it's not a lot. I mean, I think being an artist is maybe like being an author. You know, I you're it's a very you're not your work is in the public eye but you're not oh, you know, okay. or a musician or an actor or something like that or performing arts there's going to be more fanfare because people will be more uh people are likely more um you know interested in, in you as a person not just your work you right. know the obsessed fan kind of analogy the, but but you you know you I get some you know you get a lot of stuff on you know social media of course just you know flattering comments and questions and you know flirtatious sort of stuff whatever right. and uh, you get a lot of mentoring um, uh, uh, fans if you will people that you know, it's flattering. I'll have young artists send me their work and they're copying my work, but they're not copying it to sell it. They're in school or they're... Right. So you get stuff like that. And then, of well, course... Speak, speaking, of men- speaking of mentoring, though, did you have any no. mentors no. in terms of actual painting or business? No. And that's no. why I... <laughs> ironically, that's why I give back so much because I didn't have anybody. I, had, I didn't have one person help me with anything <laughs> wow because you know the, you always read these success stories in um at least a lot of the you know internet marketing type uh people a lot of which i've bought products from them information it's always like you you always have you have to have a mentor 
you can't do it without a mentor. And the mentor is why I'm successful. So it's kind of interesting to hear you say you didn't have any mentor. No, and, but it also, again, it goes back to time and place. So when I was, there was, it would be very difficult to, for me to have had a, a mentor because a, there was no internet back then. There was no way to reach out to artists, you know, like you can today. No internet. What kind of world was that? <laughs> it was black and white. The world was black. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there was really no sort of easy, low-hanging fruit ways to connect with artists, you know? There wasn't right. Instagram and Facebook. And on top of that, artists by nature as a profession, we're hidden away like authors in the woods. You know, there's it's there, we're not a big kind of forum community. So it it was it would have been hard for me. It would have been that would have been a, a lucky. Mm -hmm. opportunity if my neighbor was a you know professional painter no so I, I had to figure out literally everything on my own I mean even how to paint and how to market and how do you do this and you so just, do, you feel, do you feel sorry for these kids when they contact you and say no, I, I want to be an artist and you think no. oh my god this well I mean I I I feel bad sometimes because I don't think they really like you know when I tell them the truth of that it's, you know, it's not just going to happen overnight. And, yeah, you mean grinding it out? <laughs> you know, and, and that you have a higher likelihood, statistically, this is a fact, you have a higher likelihood to become a famous NBA basketball player than you are going to make it as an artist. <laughs> oh, man. So it's bleak. But, yeah. but I, because I didn't have help, I mean, usually you say I, I help others because I was helped. But for me, because I know how hard that was, and I was just fortunate that my personality likes taking on those kind of challenges, but I know how hard it is. I like to help. I like, I, I, I'm very generous with tips and tricks and introducing people to, to galleries. I've gotten a number of artists in galleries that I'm in. I mean, I don't feel oh, that's like... That's cool. There shouldn't be any competition. Well, what, what would be, so you mentioned tips and tricks, you know, which I want to ask you, you know, we'll kind of summarize what you think have made you successful. We kind of talked about that, but for an artist, what would be, um, you know, let's say some kid is in art school uh, or let's, let's take, let's say someone is later in their career. They are, they do have a mortgage and kids and they, they want to be a painter. What would you say? Yeah, I, I'm mentoring somebody right now that's in that position. So they're like a grown person they've got kids they got and they yeah. want to be a painter yeah and i also have another friend of mine an artist that's just down the street from me that this is sort of an interesting sidebar so this guy came to me i don't know can't remember five eight ten years ago in the doing asking the very same thing you just asked me how do i do this i'm married i have kids etc and got to be friends, et cetera, et cetera. Helped him mainly just with the professional side because he was a good painter and paints very differently than me. I have nothing to really contribute there. I helped him get into a gallery, a good oh, gallery. Cool. He's now just crushing it. You know, he wow. quit his job. He's been a professional painter for 10 years. And now he has a side business literally mentoring other artists. Oh, wow. That's so cool. What was he doing before? What was he doing? Before? I don't remember. Just, <laughs> I think he was working at the May company. And yeah, right. <laughs> well, but so he, so there's this, you know, really, it's kind of neat to see. You that's know, awesome. And, and yeah. he's helping. He has some sort of membership uh, based uh, kind of like online portfolio review and and, you know, guidance on how to get into a gallery. Basically, exactly, you know, I should get a cut, quite frankly, because he's right. basically he's <laughs> doing what I did for him. And he does workshops and stuff like that to help people that are, you know, quote-unquote grown-ups figure out a realistic way to make this work. Wow. That's really awesome. Yeah. And I guess you never know um, helping other people and just throwing out there. You never know how that may or may not come back in some fashion, but you know, you don't do it thinking about that. You just, no, kinda... it's, it's altruistic. You do it yeah. because you know, it, it, it just, it's the right thing to do. And it feels good. And for everybody, I mean, I don't, I don't want anything for it at all. How has, um, so, you know, you live in a, in a place, uh, 
reasonably affluent and, you know, kids and house and all that stuff. How has being a painter uh, affected you in any way with any other in the community, like with your kids and school and house and all that? And you kind of answered that it didn't, it didn't really, but I'm saying, you know, everyone else is doing these uh, official mm-hmm jobs like yeah you know, I manage something bank and all this kind of crap and then yeah, I mean you know I would be exaggerating if it would if, I, if it, there was something really really profoundly unique or different but you know obviously I have you know tremendous flexibility with my time uh, I work very hard but I can do that whenever I want so that gives me time to be a more active parent. You know, oh, okay, that's I'm cool. Lucky. I'm always the only dad at the puppet show, and the rest are all mom. <laughs> right. All the dads are off downtown yeah, in, the, in the big building. I was like, do you have a job? Are you, are you retired? You know. um, <laughs> so I'm just, I'm more available. I've been more available to do volunteer work, which I really enjoy. Okay. Uh, I'm not, you know, saving, you know, the whales or anything, but just volunteer work at school. A lot of stuff with sports for my kids, you know, running, running programs for, for them. I do a lot of things for charity groups. You mean uh, with your art or just other? Yeah, ones? like, you know, workshops. I did something recently with, you know, kids with cancer, which was really touching. And, and, and uh, it was a pretty, pretty touching experience, you know, t- teaching them, you know, helping them paint, working with them. And then uh, this year, there's going to be a big gala event, ironically, at Salesforce. That's kind of random. Hmm. I didn't put that together. Uh, where there'll be, uh, you know, one of those those auction nights, you know, dinner and drinks and the auction paintings and that money goes to the charity. I do, I do stuff like that all the time. And I, I like it. You know, I feel like, you know, why not? So that's a, that's a big benefit. Um, yeah, you know, I've lived here long enough that people are always asking for stuff like that, and I'm more than happy to do it. Yeah, that's you know, I mean, this this sounds great, and and um, it's just so awesome to hear uh, about someone following their path, something they like that makes them feel good, and you know, make that work, and then you can also actually give back as well. So it's, it's I mean, it, it all sounds good. Are there, are there any downfalls at all, or? You know, yeah, it, exactly. all, it all sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> Can I do that? How do I paint? <laughs> yeah, I want to paint. You just need a lot of uh, therapy and anxiety meds. No, <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, there's no, there's no, you know, profound downsides I can think of. Um, I mean, what about like, you know, some, some people are more security. Yeah, I was just going to say that. about like financial security. Yeah, and, you know. what it, it, it is. I am less anxious about that component of this career based purely on the fact that I'm trusting that history repeats itself. Okay. The fact that. I mean, you've been doing this for 25 years. It's, it's not actually, like. It's actually 30 years. Thir- is it 30? 30 years. So the fact that it hasn't gone wrong yet <laughs> gives me the sort of arrogant blind bravado that the ship is going to keep floating. Right. Right. But if I really sit back and think about it, like, especially if I'm doing, you know, I just bought a house and doing a remodel, you know, and I'm eating a lot of top ramen lately. Uh, I'll, if I sit back and think about how risky it is and say, okay, I have three kids. I'm, spending every dollar I have right now. And uh, I have no idea when the next check's coming. I mean, it's freaking crazy. By the way, so for the, for the listeners right now, I am talking to Eric over a video feed and right above his head is a missing roof. (laughs) There's no (laughs) roof in your house. What's the, (laughs) <laughs> that's part of the reconstruction. Yeah. It's literally yeah. Roof- no, I'm doing a head to toe, massive remodel. So okay. that's a whole other story. <laughs> but yeah. So, I mean, that there is, so yeah, there's this perception that I have less security, but on the other hand, you could argue that I have all the security in the world because I'm not at 
the beck and call of somebody that I work for. Yeah, who could just fire you, especially these days, right? You're dispensable. Yeah. I don't have the regularity of a predictable paycheck, but I know that nobody can take my job away. <laughs> right, right. So it's it's just how you you know, how you intellectualize and look at your, your situation. But uh, maybe another sort of theoretical downfall is, you know, there is a, I love being alone. I'm totally fine being alone, but there is a, sometimes a little bit of a, a loneliness or an isolation. Mm -hmm. If I'm really, really cranking on a purposeful, uh, period of time, like for a show that's upcoming or something like that, then I'm just so caught up in, you know, working, painting that I'm not lonely. It's active. Do, do right you feel now, like right now, you know, I don't, I don't really have anything to do today. You know, I could go paint because I should just because for painting's sake. Right. But, you know, I'm, my show opens next week. Everything's done. I'm kind of like, I'm just doing this interview with you today. And then I don't know. I'll go get a sandwich. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know there's, so there's sort of an ice professional isolationism to it. Right. Boy, it m must be nice not to have to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it must be nice having all those friends down at the office that you can laugh and talk about your Netflix show. <laughs> <laughs> well, so not to go to a dark place, but I, sure. what would happen if you didn't find you know, obviously you had a pretty sour, um, uh, experience there at May company, you know, God, if you didn't find this painting and something you liked, what do you, what would you be doing? Let's say you didn't find that and you're just miserable. I don't know. I mean, that's, you know, I, 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 it'd be impossible. I guess it's kind of pointless to, to even impossible. go there. I was just curious. I, I impossible to answer. I mean, I, I would think that my, my, uh, stubbornness to find something that makes me happy would have ended up presenting something for me. I mean, yeah. I, would, I would not have continued a life of misery for sure, but I have no idea. I mean, my, my spidey sense says that it would probably have been just something else, non-conventional, you know, right. opening a little business or I, I just, I have, I, you know, I don't know, but I know that I would have died if I put that noose around my neck on a, with my suit every day and sat at a cubicle for the rest of my life, I, I wouldn't have made it. You know, I just heard um, uh, Jordan Peterson. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a psychologist. He's kind of come up in the last year. But um, just a thought for the listeners, he had mentioned that when you, let's say you're stuck in a job that you hate um, and you're afraid to leave that and try something new, you got to think, okay, um, what are my choices? Well, I can stay here. I'm already miserable <laughs> yeah. or I could try something else that might fail and maybe that'll be hard, but it's not like you got to kind of choose your poison in a way. You know what I think, you know, just to kind of not to say to sum this up, but just to kind of sum up this part of it is I think the real, the real answer to this riddle is first of all, you have to be honest with yourself you have to ask yourself, you know, what color is my parachute? You know, what, what do I like to do? What do I want to do? You have to right. start there. And it's not, you don't always have the answer right away, but you got, you have to start with what do you want, not just look at the things that came at you and then you pick. You have to, you have to be the, the creator of the thing that you're picking, right? right. So you start with, well, what, do, what do I want? And then the thing where most people mess up is that they don't activate. You have to activate. You have right. to say, I'm going, I, I am going to do this. And then the final thing that most people don't do. So you've, you've decided what you want to do. You've activated. You must complete. Okay. You have to complete even if you fail. But most people, most people don't even start. And then, but most people start, and then when they're halfway around the track, they're like, "Yeah, forget it." Yeah, I. Well, if, I if I'm going to be honest, first of all, let me summarize because th this is actually 
one of the main things that I'm hoping to get out of the podcast to, to help other people and myself is tips. And you just basically laid out, I was going to ask, what are your, what are your tips, you know, for somebody basically one, figure out what you want to do. Activate. Right. And then number, number two though, was activate, activate. And number three is complete. to complete and you finish I, the painting. <laughs> yeah. Finish the painting. Yeah. And you know, it sounds so simp- simple, right? Paint by the numbers, one, two, three. Yeah. But, you know, I've had multiple things where I couldn't figure out number one, what do I want to do? Because I have a lot of interest. I'm all over the place. Two, did I activate? Y'all usually activate, but did I complete? And I fell down halfway around the track. That So, you know, I mean, you just well, kind of... you're not that. alone. You're not... And that's the thing. It's like, nobody should ever... It's so t- it's so common, especially I, I don't know how old you are, but you know <laughs> when we sort of you know I'm a couple of years older than you. Let's put it that when, way. You know, uh, most people have whether it's a, you want to call it a midlife crisis or a midlife assessment. No, I that, call it a crisis. That, that failure to complete is very common. <laughs> There's, it's it's a normal part of our human experience. There's no there should, there should be no shame in that, but it should be something that you that to persist. You right. know, to, it's way better to complete something and have it not work than to just not ever know if it would yeah. work. You know, and I don't know. It's just me. I'd rather live a life of finishing things and evaluating whether they worked or not than wondering if they would have worked. Yeah. Otherwise, I mean, we don't have that much time on this earth. You know, they say 80 spins and my God, you know, I mean, here I am, I'm over 50 like you and I wouldn't, I've had some good times. I've had some times where I was in my groove creatively, but I wasn't making any money and uh, fell into the get money for crack, you know, uh, for a lot of my life. And here I am now. And uh, there's just not a lot of spins around this earth to to waste, at least not trying going all the way, all the way through identifying, activating, and and completing to at least find out right. And the worst that could happen is you you, you try again, or you know the it worst is, thing that could happen is to do nothing. I think if I could yeah. say that to my to audience, ask, doing nothing is the worst. Mm-hmm. It'd be interesting to ask people that are on their deathbed, you know, this question, you know. It'd be interesting. You know, um, yeah, that's, uh, well, I think, I think they always, those deathbed questions. I think people always talk about people and relationships and, but to ask about um, their career, that would be interesting. Yeah. I don't think they talk about, I was so glad that I got that big sale and blah, 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 blah. Now maybe, you know, I, I was able to help the world by, you know, you know, there actually is a book. I just remembered some. There's a book. I think it's by Studs Terkel called "Working." Mm-hmm. It was written back, you know, and when I, I think I read it in college in psychology class, and it, he interviewed, you know, like the whole gamut of professions. So you learned something in college. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I heard somebody quote. I'm going to totally screw up this quote. It's not really a quote. It's more of a statement. But I had a conversation with somebody at some point about what we're talking about. And they said, you know, you found your purpose, your, at least with your career, when you never think about retirement. Yeah. I mean, if you're thinking about, you hear it all the time, people can't wait to retire. I don't understand that concept. I don't get it. You know, I'm not judging any, anybody, but that's, that's, that's a bummer. That means that your job is, is a, a sentence that you're waiting to finish. Yeah. You know, the best, I mean, it's the optimal thing is to not ever know what that word means, retirement. Yeah. We all want to be financially solvent and secure, but I, I don't sit around thinking, okay, I'm 52. I'd like to stop painting when I'm 65 so that I can, what? I don't know. What do I do? <laughs> you can, so you can relax and paint for enjoyment. <laughs> yeah, you know, and so that, that's kind of a, might be a way to start. Remember that one, two, three, we, one, two, three yeah. thing we said, you know, yeah. 
what do I want to do? Maybe it's more like, what would I like to do until I die? Right. You know? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. And, and okay. so many, there are so many people that have jobs that we kind of, uh, I have to be careful with my, how I say this, um, you know, that aren't the highest income producing and I don't, I don't get the most social accolades, like maybe a, a kindergarten teacher, you know, they're, they're, right. they're happy. Right. They love it. They love being a teacher. Like they're, they're going to be that old lady teacher when they're 90 because they right. love it. Right. You know? That's what we should all as men and women, at least, at least pursue. Right. You know, just try. And, and I, um, you know, that's great. I love, I love, and this kind of falls into the number one of finding your passion is do something that you would like to do the rest of your life. And you're not thinking about re- retirement, which is weird. Um, yeah. So that, that's, I guess you would call that a, a life worth living. And you know, obviously we tend to monetize, put everything in financial terms because we mm-hmm. need money, but really that, that it's really completely separate from fulfillment and yeah. stuff you want to do with your life. Right. It's a, it's an after effect. It's an and after the, coinc- and the, the coincidence is that, you know, usually if you do something that you like, you're likely to become good at it. <laughs> right. Most likely right. if you if like, it's, if it's working, if it's working, if you like something, you're going to do it a lot. And usually if you do something a lot, you, you're going to improve. And usually you'll end up making money. If you're good at something, you, you will be able to monetize it. Right. So, right. and that, and maybe that is again, going back to that, you know, what do you want to do? Activate and complete because it's some, you know, if you do what you, well, you get the point, do what you love yeah. and then you will follow. <laughs> right. <laughs> there you go. I mean, you know, we could have just um, bypassed this whole interview and just, yeah. I just put that quote up and that's it. So, you know what? That's um, awesome. Eric. I know we're getting late on time. And again, I, I know we repeated this, but, but for myself and for the listeners, Eric's tips are, it's very simple, but it's very true. And, you know, as we've heard, you can do this at any age, even if you're, you know, got the mortgage and kids, but really be truthful with yourself and, and, you know, think about what your passions are, find one, activate, meaning do something about it, take the steps you know, like Eric, start painting and you got to walk to a cafe or sell a painting to your neighbor, you know, whatever your steps are, you got to start. And then you got to complete, complete the damn painting, complete the project, complete, you know, talking to people about it. You have to do those things or, you've, or you're not really giving yourself a chance to, to make something work. So, um, I mean, that really encapsulates, I think, some really good tips that we can take away from this podcast. Don't you think? I, I think so. <laughs> well, yeah, especially because you said it. <laughs> I'm trying to take credit here at the end. But you know, um, what? And, don't, and don't take rejection so personally. That's that's you know, I, I wish I would have mentioned that earlier. Particularly for artists, if you're, any artists are listening, it it, it just got to have realistic realistic expectations. It's like it's going to take a while, and right, it, it just it doesn't mean anything. You know, it just means. That that day when you went to the gallery to show your work, they just weren't interested that day. Right. Just for a million different things, you don't know why. But it's just, you got to persist. And that kind of comes to, you know, if you've got a passion for what you're doing, that gets you over those humps. Well, I'm not going to listen to that person. I'm going to keep going. Whereas if you're just kind of throwing darts at a dartboard, you know, a, just a little bump like that might be enough to get you to stop uh, yep. executing and stop completing. Um, so I understand you've got a an event next week. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And also, <clears throat> how can people find out more information about you? Take a look at your paintings. You know, funny, we did this whole podcast. We didn't actually talk about your paintings, <laughs> which are, you know, usually that's the first thing. Like you're, oh, what do you paint and all that stuff? Eric has very beautiful figurative oil paintings, um, diving, splashing, swimming underwater. Uh, if I may say, uh, attractive female form is in a lot of these paintings. If I, is that putting it artistically? <laughs> Very artistically. Okay. Um, so 
where can people, what's, what's your website so people can come check it out? I mean, you really should uh, yeah. take a look at Eric's paintings. Well, it's just my name. So it's just ericzener.com. Okay, well, I'm going to spell it out because uh, it's E-R-I-C-Z-E-N-E-R.com. Yeah, so that's my sort of billboard, if you will, on the internet highway. And then I'm on Facebook and on Instagram. Um, I actually can't even remember. I don't remember what my name is. <laughs> I think it's my name. I just, I don't use it that Boy, often. that's the way to market yourself there. <laughs> I don't use it that often, um, but it's just sort of fun to look at once in a while. But no, Instagram is just my name again. Okay, Eric Zener. So at Eric Zener. Facebook, I think is Eric Zener Studio. It's Eric Zener Studio? Yeah, on Facebook. I don't have a personal account. I, I don't like Facebook. I don't want anybody to know where I'm having coffee. And quite frankly, I don't care where you're having coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, So next Thursday night, the 19th, uh, I'll have my solo exhibition in New York at Gallery Hennick. And they're in, they're in Chelsea. And uh, I think it's my maybe my 20th solo show with them. Right. Wow, I've been oh. with them. I've been with them for a little over twenty years. Wow, yeah. So I usually have one big show with them a year. Um, okay, yeah, right around tax time this year. Yeah. <laughs> best time. What, what if what if a listener wants to contact you about uh, commission? You know, I should mention if you look at Eric's bio, he has some pretty amazing people as as. Um, as patrons or customers, however I can put that artistically. Um, you know, I, I see the Gettys are listed there. So, you know, some rather prominent uh, people are collectors of yours, but how would somebody, would they just go to your site and contact you yeah, if they were interested? That's the easiest. I mean, you just, just send me a note from the website and. Okay. Can I get my affiliate link <laughs> <laughs> so I can make some money? <laughs> just, yeah, if, if you discovered me on Manceptual, you'll get ten percent. Yeah, ten percent uh, commission Finder, discount. Finder's fee. Yeah. So um, awesome, Eric. Thank you for uh, coming on and sharing uh, sharing your life with us. I think it's enlightening and 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 hopeful, <clears throat> you know, to to kind of follow your dreams. Uh, it's going to take work, right? There's no shortcuts in life. I think um, we can all agree on that. But uh, it sounds very fulfilling, and I'm hoping for, for all the listeners and myself, you know, we find our own paths, such as you have, and uh, have completed, <laughs> complete the painting. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the last word of advice. Uh, anything else, Eric? Or That's it. So what are you going to do right now? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just joking. I'm going to go to the studio. I'm doing some uh, fun stuff right now. Now that my show's done, there's other paintings that I want to do just for painting's sake. I don't know what, what, what's going to happen with them, but I'm doing some big, um, I call them treescapes. Treescapes, they're, okay. They're, they're just more of a visceral, enjoyable, no pressure filled painting experience. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll probably do that and then go pick up my kids. And yeah, then same as everybody else at night. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks again. Appreciate it. Uh, hopefully some point in the future we can have you back on and uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the paintings themselves. But uh, I think today was fantastic. So uh, have a good rest of the afternoon. All right. Take care. All right. Catch you later.